All right, thank you, Marcella. I don't know if uh, you folks know, but she was actually at NASA Ames too, doing robotics work, so uh, it's good to see her again. So again, my name's Brian Day. I work over at NASA Ames Research Center, and I like to think I've got a pretty cool job. For the last eight years or so, I've spent working on robotic missions to the moon, sending robotic explorers to the moon. That's been really cool. I will tell you more detail about uh, some of those missions and some of the fun things we've discovered. Uh, before that, in uh, 2007, I got to do something that was really cool. We had some pretty smart people at Ames who realized that the Earth was going to pass through the orbit of a particularly interesting comet. And it looked like we were going to encounter debris from that comet. And that debris was going to hit our upper atmosphere and burn up in a meteor shower of particular interest high up in the upper atmosphere. And so uh, NASA equipped a couple of special aircraft to go very high up into the upper atmosphere and get front row seats to observe and record a meteor shower. And I got to do that. That was pretty cool. <laughs> And uh, before that, I got to do some work where we uh, did what's called Mars analog work. We find some of the harshest, most extreme places here on Earth, places that have a lot in common with Mars. And we go there and we figure out how to live and work on Mars, how to do science on Mars, kind of practice wells, and how life might adapt to Mars. So for instance, one of the places I went was the Atacama Desert in South America, the driest desert in the world, 50 times drier than Death Valley. And it's been arid to hyper-arid since the time of the dinosaurs. If you want to see a place that looks like Mars, man, this is it. Uh, no animals, no birds, no plants, no insects, no bacteria in the soil even. It is more than surgical room sterile. We were there in the winter time, so the daytime temperatures only got up to about 110. And then the sun would set, and it would drop below freezing. Really an interesting place to work. So I've, I've had a bunch of pretty cool experiences. It's been a lot of fun. Now, you've probably met people you know, these people who are like really driven and like who have known since they were this tall, this is what I'm going to do with my life. And they just have this straight path. And that's, that's, that's you know, that's really cool. I was never like that. <laughs> um, when I was young and growing up, there were two things I was in love with. I, I loved astronomy and I loved flying. And I was going to be a pilot. I was going to be a commercial airline pilot. I was going to see the world. God, man, it was going to be great. And so, you know, when I was uh, 18, I got my pilot's license. So, this is good. This is going to be cool. This is fun. Of course, you have to have a college degree also. Now, they didn't care what the degree was in. They just said you had to have a college degree. Well, yeah, I love astronomy. I'll go ahead. I'll get my astronomy degree. Why? Man, life is good. And then something called the Arab oil embargo hit. And all of a sudden, airlines, just as I was ready to get into the field, airlines were laying off pilots right and left. Uh-oh, that didn't work out so well. So I said, well, hey, you know, going to school, studying astronomy, I'll just be an astronomer. That's what I love. So, you know, I was working in the local observatory there on the campus, and and doing some cool research and everything was good and I was about to be an astronomer and then the chairman of the department called us all in one day. And he said the federal government has cut virtually all funding for basic research. There will be no jobs available and must advise you to find a new major. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, well, fortunately, you know, I studied a lot of science so that gave me a little bit of an advantage. And somewhere, I remember seeing a scientist and when in doubt, go to medical school. 
<laughs> so I uh, turned around and I took a whole bunch of biology courses, and uh, yeah, I ended up going to medical school. UCLA Medical School, doing medical physics, applying physics to problems in medicine. And um, I quickly made an important discovery. Going to medical school is a really good thing to do if you are devoted to that. It's something you have planned your whole life to do. I am going to be a doctor. Going to medical school is not such a great thing to do as a third choice. <laughs> <laughs> and I soon realized, especially in the area where I was mainly cancer, and I was seeing like, I'm seeing people die every day, and I wasn't really prepared for that. And so um, one day I really got my courage up and I dropped out of medical school. I felt really good about that until I had to call my parents. <laughs> that did not feel so good. But uh, my dad was good. He said, okay, I'm ready to hear your reasons. And I explained to him, he said, those are good reasons. Now what are you going to do? Well, I have to get back to your dad. Okay, but it don't take too long. So I went to the career center there at college and I said, well, I see you've taken a lot of programming classes. Well, yeah. Do you ever consider being a software engineer? No. Well, why don't you do that? So again, I went back to school and took a bunch more programming courses. And I became a software engineer. I moved up here to Silicon Valley and I spent years doing software engineering. And it was cool. It paid the bills. And, but it wasn't any other thing that I ever really dreamed of doing. And then I saw an opportunity to actually do some volunteer work over at NASA. So I showed up at NASA, I said, you need some help? I said, sure. So I started doing some programming there at NASA for free, and started getting to know the people, and they started getting to know them. Okay, you're, you're a software engineer, and you're an astronomer, and you're a pilot. Hmm, maybe we can use you. So I ended up getting hired, which was really cool. And that was great, but then I started realizing that three of the jobs there were you know, really cool projects, like flying through a meteor shower, or you know, sending rockets to the moon. I really needed that graduate degree in astronomy. So I went back to school <laughs> again. <laughs> and it paid off. And that, that's when I really started to get to do the really cool things. So, um, you know, I guess my, my, the advice portion of my talk comes at the end, but uh, you can kind of smell where it's going. But right now what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about just some of the cool things we've been doing on the moon. Uh, the moon is turning out to be a really interesting uh, when I went to school, I learned that the moon was completely arid. No water at all, don't even bother looking. There's no water there, bone dry. Completely airless, no atmosphere, and geologically dead. Okay, sounds like a pretty boring place. Turns out, now because of a new generation of robotic lunar explorers, we have learned that all that is wrong. But in fact, if you pick up any textbook today about the moon, it is wrong. And that's really exciting. <laughs> when all of a sudden, all these things that you thought you knew turn out not to be the case, then you're on to something really interesting. So, one of the things we started realizing was that maybe the moon is not bone dry. There are craters at the poles of the moon where the sunlight hasn't shown for over a billion years, permanent shadows. And because they're so dark for so very long, they're really cold. Coldest places we've measured anywhere in the solar system. Well, if it's that cold, maybe there's like ice in there. And we had a few probes back in the 1990s that gave us hints. Yeah, there might be ice in there. So we decided we really want to find out. So we put together two spacecraft, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or LRO, and the Lunar Crater Observation and Sensing Satellite, or LCROSS. And I was mostly, at that time, really involved with LCROSS. So it was, it was my baby, it was my first moon mission, so I'm really gonna talk fondly about it. And it was 
a really cool concept. So they launched together, both spacecraft launched together on this big Atlas V rocket out of Cape Canaveral. And that was a really special day. My mom had always been really supportive of me. You know, and all these twists and turns, she was always, okay, fine, do what you need to do. She had been a first grade teacher and she was always, you know, encouraging me to learn more. And so, on this day when my first moon mission launched out of Cape Canaveral, I actually got to have my mom there in the VIP section, sitting there watching my rocket take off into the sky. Oh my God. I mean, as if a moon launch isn't special enough. You see your mom there jumping up and down and screaming, man, that was cool. So, the idea behind Elcross is really neat. Pretty simple. We wanted to excavate one of those permanently shadowed craters. So the Elcross spacecraft actually held on to the upper stage of our moon rock, something about the size of a school bus, weighed two tons, We're moving at 5,600 miles an hour, considerably faster than your average school bus. Now normally, once you leave Earth orbit, you throw away that upper stage. It's just dead weight, you don't want it anymore. But we held on to it, and we carried it to the moon with us. The idea is, once we got to the moon, as we came in towards one of those permanently shadowed craters, we turned around, aimed it carefully at that crater, let go of it, fired our rockets to slow down, and let that thing go speeding down into the crater, 5,600 miles an hour, slams into the ground, blasts hundreds of tons of stuff off the floor of that crater, out of the shadows, into the sunlight, high into the sky above the moon, and then we dove our spacecraft down through that cloud of debris, sensed it, analyzed it, sniffed it. That's how we discovered water. And then four minutes after that rocket upper stage hit, we hit. Four really busy minutes, mission over. <laughs> Did I mention this was a fun job? <laughs> so here's a picture of Elcross actually being built. Um, and here it is, being lowered into the, the thermal vacuum test chamber, making sure it's going to be fine in the, in the vacuum of space and in the temperature extremes. And then this is Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral. And this is where we were launching from. And yes, and although you, you do not go into those brush areas around there, there are definitely alligators and they will eat you. <laughs> Next door, so you can see the launch towers over there on the left. This right here is the vertical integration building. And this is where the rocket is actually assembled, near the launch pad. So what happens is there at the big long runway at Kennedy Space Center, this giant Russian jet, Antonov cargo jet, comes landing. And here it has the first stage of the rocket inside it. And the nose of the jet folds open and it I mean, it's gross looking. It's like it's regurgitating this rocket. Everybody kind of goes, ew. But it comes out, and they take it into the building, they unwrap it, and it's nice and shiny, and now everybody goes, ooh, that's pretty. And you stand there, you get your picture taken next to it, and hey, now it's starting to look pretty good. And after the, you do a little bit of basic checkout, you put it on a trailer, and you wheel it out to the vertical integration building there, getting it ready to start stacking the rocket. And here a crane is lifting it up. Yeah, you're holding your breath during this part. And it gets settled into the vertical integration facility there. And here comes the Russian jet again. And it barfs up the second stage. <laughs> and you go, ooh. But, uh, you know, the sun sets, they unwrap it, and it looks pretty, and everybody goes, ah. And it starts rolling off. And it gets lifted up with a crane. Now, again, this is the part, this is that upper stage. This is the part we used as a big sledgehammer to hit the floor of that crater. So there it is being lifted up. And now, inside the clean room there, you've got the payload fairing, the protective shell at the very top. And inside, you've got both LRO and L-Cross stacked on top of each other, and they're about to be closed up. They get carted off 
again, really beautiful picture. That's the uh, big building behind us, huge building where the Saturn V rockets that went to the moon were assembled and where the space shuttle would be uh, ready. And uh, then the crane lifts, LRO and L cross, again, up into the vert vertical integration facility. Again, everybody's really holding their breaths on this one. Gets brought in, everybody starts hooking everything up, getting it ready to go. And there it is, the rocket stacked inside there. Now it's starting to look like, hey, this is really going to happen. Uh, the view from the bottom is pretty exceptional. It's pretty exciting. I love getting the expression of some of my coworkers. <laughs> um, and of course, you have to pose at the base of the rocket. So then, the whole thing rolls out on a set of train tracks. It rolls out of the vertical integration building and out toward the actual launch pad itself. And here it is at the pad. It's all hooked up with umbilicals that supply power and environmental, um, all kinds of monitoring, fueling. Hey, now this is starting to look like it's really going to happen. So here's a fun picture. There we are, ready to launch. And if you look in the background, there's one of the space shuttles getting ready to launch. We kind of ended up having fights over who was going to go first. I mean, it's, it sounds like I'm joking. I'm not. <laughs> I had some of the space shuttle guys in my hotel room one night in an elevator. We almost got it. <laughs> but we launched. And uh, wow, was that exciting. Um, goes shooting off the pad. And it's kind of neat to know that inside there, inscribed on something that's going to the moon, etched in a piece of metal is your name. Wow. My name is about to get bashed to pieces on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, so we took a kind of a long way to the moon. We got there in two days. But we didn't do anything. Instead, we just flew under the moon and used the moon's gravity to sling us up into this great big wide orbit around the whole Earth-Moon system. So that when we came back again, we'd come right back at the South Pole at a 90 degree angle. Because we wanted to hit as hard as we could. So this is a view taken from the l -Cross spacecraft after we've let go of that upper stage. We're looking into the crater Cabeus near the South Pole of the Moon, that dark area is a permanently shadowed, shadowed area inside that crater. And if you look very carefully, you'll see a white dot inside that shadow. That is the flash of that centaur upper stage hitting the ground. This is what we wanted to have happen. Another view of the crater Cabeus, and you can see the shadowed area. If you look very carefully, there's kind of a lighter patch there in the shadow. That's that cloud of stuff starting to rise up off the floor of the crater. That's what we're going to dive down into. So this here is data from l -Cross. This is what we discovered. This is called the spectrum. The spectrum is kind of the fingerprint of the atoms that you were encountering. The atoms and the molecules. So what we have here is a graph of color, the wavelength along the bottom, and brightness going up the side. The red line is a reference spectrum. <clears throat> that is essentially the fingerprint of water. The black dots are the actual l -cross data. And you can see wherever you have a dip in that water reference spectrum, you have a dip in the l -cross data. So that shows that we did indeed discover water. Now you'll see there are some other dips in the l -cross data. That's because we discovered a whole lot more than just water. Carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, ammonia, methane, it goes on and on and on. All kinds of stuff. People will be going through this data for years, figuring out what all is in that stuff and you know, dug up. So, one of the latest things I've been doing, I just finished it up uh, fairly recently, last year, was another mission to the moon called Laddie. The Lunar Atmosphere and Dust Environment Explorer. And that's kind of weird. Because again, when I went to school, I learned that the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. Well, it does, and this was sent to go explore it. 
Uh, it's a thin atmosphere, but the idea was we were going to send lighting into orbit around the moon, and then it would drop down low and it'd actually fly through the atmosphere, sample it, let us know what it's made of, what its structure is, and how it changes over time. So again, the moon's atmosphere is thin. Here at roughly sea level, if you take a cubic centimeter of air, you'll find about 10 to the 19th molecules. It's a whole bunch of molecules. If you did the same thing on the surface of the moon, your sample would contain about 100,000 to a few million molecules. Sounds like a lot, but that's actually an excellent laboratory vacuum. The thickness of the atmosphere on the moon is similar to the thickness of the outermost fringes of the Earth's atmosphere where our astronauts do spacewalks at the International Space Station. It's really thin. But even though it's thin, it's not inconsequential. It's actually energized by the sun. And it glows. Now, you may have never seen the glow of the moon's atmosphere. But that's because it's always next to the big bright moon. If somehow you could remove the moon and magically leave behind to do that. Um, if you could leave behind that atmosphere, then from a dark sky, you'd be able to look up and just with your unaided eye, you'd be able to see that glow in the sky. And at the time we did this, we didn't know what that was made of. We knew it glowed strongly in the light of sodium, but that was just because sodium tends to be really bright. Um, the technical name for the moon's atmosphere is called the surface boundary exosphere. Basically, that means it's a really thin atmosphere. Here on Earth, the motion of molecules in our atmosphere is dominated by collisions between those molecules. In a surface boundary exosphere, the atmosphere is so thin that it's essentially a collisionless environment. The molecules are free to move without interacting with each other. They just carry out ballistic arcs governed by the energy that they have and the gravity of the moon. So it's mechanically very different. We also know that there's dust in the lunar atmosphere. We got our first clues from this, from the surveyor spacecraft, the robotic landers that landed on the moon before Apollo. And they had cameras on board. They would look out in the distance at times when the sun was just below the horizon, and they'd see these glows above the horizon. Well, if there's nothing in the lunar sky, you wouldn't expect to see a glow. Something was catching that sunlight and bouncing it back down to the camera. And so what we came to believe was that it's dust being kicked up off the surface of the moon, probably by meteorite impacts. Why do we care about any of this? What does it matter? Well, it turns out this type of atmosphere that we have on the moon the surface boundary exosphere is actually the most common kind of atmosphere in our solar system. We're an exception. The moon has a surface boundary exosphere. Mercury has one. Many of the moons of the giant planets, many of the larger asteroids, even some of the distant Kuiper Belt objects, icy worlds out beyond Neptune. This is the most common type of atmosphere in our solar system. And if you're going to understand atmospheres, and let's face it, we want to understand atmospheres, we depend on those pretty much. So if you want to understand atmospheres, it's probably a good idea to get a handle on what the most common type of atmosphere is. We're going to encounter this again and again and again as we move out through the solar system. So this is Lang. It stood about two meters tall, 330 kilograms, 53 kilograms of scientific instruments. And here is Laddie being assembled at NASA Ames Research Center. This is actually the first time we had built a spacecraft at NASA Ames. When we'd done this type of thing, like with LCROSS, you know, we had a partner like Northrop Grumman build it down there. But here, we actually put it together at NASA Ames, so it was really very cool to watch. 
Uh, after it uh, got assembled, it got put into this highly stylish thermos looking thing and loaded onto a truck and sent trundling off across the country on this truck. Not to Cape Canaveral, but to Wallops Island, just off the coast of Virginia. That is NASA's oldest launch facility. So here's Laddie, safely arrived at Wallops Island, getting ready to be prepared to meet its rocket. Here's Laddie being put on top of the fifth, yes, five stage, the fifth stage of the rocket. And again, the protective payload fairing being placed around it. And then Laddie was put on the very top of the rocket in the launch pad there, big crane. And there's the rocket. You can see a couple of guys up at the top of the launch gantry there. Gives you an idea of scale. And pulling back, there's our beautiful rocket on the beautiful beach of beautiful Wallops Island where the mosquitoes are the size of flamingos. <laughs> and Funny thing about this rocket, this is a Minotaur 5 rocket. Not only is it a Minotaur 5 rocket, it is the very first Minotaur 5 rocket. This is the first time this rocket had ever flown. And we got to ride on top of it. <clears throat> now I'll tell you a story. Back during Elkross, we launched on an Atlas V, and the Atlas V is the most tried, tested, successful launch vehicle we have in our fleet. And I didn't sleep for three weeks before that launch. I had all those dreams, you've seen the pictures, of the movies, the videos of the rockets blowing up over the pad, uh, that was a wreck. And when I learned we were gonna launch on the very first Minotaur V, I realized I was so screwed. <laughs> but, it's a pretty rocket. And here it is, here we are looking at the launch pad, the day of the launch, this is several hours before. Uh, turns out we launched at night. And there we go. It was a beautiful, perfectly clear night all along the eastern seaboard. We lit up the sky from the Carolinas in the south to Canada in the north. Millions of people saw us shoot into the sky as we made our way to the moon. It was spectacular. Really an amazing, amazing thing to watch. Here it is flying over New York City. Uh, another picture I've seen of it flying over Washington, D.C. Generally, they don't like to see things like that over Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> we did warn them. Okay. <laughs> the frog. You know this. You know the story. Well, at least some of you do. Um, yeah, that's, that's for real. That is a frog in the upper left there. <laughs> okay, so it turns out there's this pond of water near the launch pad. And this water is used, actually, in a protection system, uh, uh, an acoustic protection system that protects the rocket and the launch pad from the thermal and acoustic shock of the launch. So the spray of water comes out and uh, it's pulled out of that pond. Therefore, that pond is actually a remarkably bad place to take up residence if you're a frog. <laughs> uh, no one seems to have notified the frog of this stuff. So the frog was in there. The rocket launch, this supersonic wind, several thousand degrees, hits that pond. This is actually a video frame. This is a one frame out of a video. This is the only frame in that video that the frog shows up in. <laughs> what that means is this frog is moving. <laughs> As we realized that night, we had two successful launches. We had a glitter launch. <laughs> as well as the suborbital launch of a frog. <laughs> now, this went viral. This was all over the internet. It was on TV. We 
was on the network news. It made the center section of Time Magazine's images of the year. <laughs> Turned on Meet the Press one morning, and there it is, the damn frog. <laughs> we were inundated. Emails, Facebook messages, all kinds of tweets. Tell us about the frog, frogs, okay, right? You didn't hurt the frog, frogs fine, right? Please, frogs fine. Um, <laughs> Other messages kept coming, please tell us about the frog, the frog's fine, right? didn't hurt the frog. And finally, our public affairs office lets out a really brilliant statement. The condition of the frog is unknown. <laughs> <laughs> Surprisingly enough, that didn't satisfy anyone. Frog's fine, right? Please, frog's fine. Finally, one of my bosses gets on Facebook and goes, Damn, now all the birds are going to want their frogs cooked. <laughs> but that being said, we did have a very successful launch. The first flight of the Minotaur 5, the first uh, spacecraft built at NASA Ames. We launched, we didn't go straight to the moon again, we did a series of what we call phasing loops. Elliptical orbits that get higher and higher and eventually after three months, got us up to the moon just as the moon came along in its orbit. We fired our engines, went into orbit around the moon, a nice high orbit where we could sit for a while, check out all our instruments, make sure everything was working fine. After 30 days of checking everything out, getting a nice warm, fuzzy feeling, when we fired our engines again, dropped down low, and started our 100-day science mission of flying through the moon's atmosphere. Here are some pictures from Laddie of the moon. He said, this was good to see. Yeah, made it to the right place. Here is sunrise, as seen by Laddie. It's real bright. <laughs> um, so after 100 days, man, everything was going well. Our instruments are still working great. And uh, we had plenty of fuel, so we got permission to extend our mission. We kept flying until April 18th, when we finally had run out of fuel, we spiraled down and impacted the far side of the moon. April 18th, uh, it, was, it was exciting. So, you know, it's been almost a year now since Laddie ended, and uh, quite, quite an adventure. What we found out is that uh, there are a bunch of different components in the lunar atmosphere, and they all, behave independently. They all act differently. So it's like the moon has a bunch of different atmospheres. Helium stays up in the atmosphere the whole time. Argon at night settles down and just lies on the ground. When the sun rises, it picks up again. You get an argon wind across the lunar surface. It's a very strange place. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or LRO. This is the one that launched with LCROSS, and it's still orbiting the moon right now. It's got a really good camera on board, really super high detail. It's got a laser altimeter that can measure all the ups and downs on the surface of the moon real well. It can peer into those dark, permanently shadowed areas in a really sophisticated night vision. It measures the radiation environment on the moon, the temperature on the moon. It can sniff out ice deposits. I mentioned that camera is really good. This is the Apollo 14 landing site, as imaged by LRO. On the right hand side there, you can see the descent stage of the lunar module. This is what the astronauts actually rode down to the surface of the moon. On um, the left hand side where that arrow is pointing, that's an instrument package that was left behind by the astronauts on the moon. And if you look very carefully, you'll see some dark squiggly lines in between. Those are the actual footprints of the astronauts. This is a good camera. <laughs> now, the project I'm working on now is called the Lunar Mapping and Modeling Portal. And what we do is we use this to take all the data that we're getting from LRO and all of the other missions we've had going to the moon, all the instruments on all those missions, and we bring it all together into a tool that we can use for doing mission planning, that we could use for 
doing lunar science, and that we use for public outreach. This is all available to you on our website. If you go to lmmp.nasa.gov, you can explore the moon in very fine detail. You can measure the diameter of features. You can measure the height and depth of features. This is the elevation tool. And what we're doing here is, you see all those little bumps? Those are volcanoes on the moon. They're little volcanoes. And we always wondered, why are the volcanoes on the moon so small? You know, on Earth, we have giant shield volcanoes. Mars, we have giant shield volcanoes. Venus. Uh, Eo, Jupiter, we see them everywhere. We don't see them on the moon. Well, we draw a line across them, and we use our elevation tool, we see that all those little volcanoes are actually cones sitting on top of a great, big, low, broad volcano. There are giant shields on the moon. They're just hiding from us. So some of the other tools we have. So this is looking at this high-resolution image looking at a mountain, the central peak in the center of a crater called Tycho. And we can change it up so that we can see uh, hill shape representation, color the different altitudes, now the peak stands out a little better. We can also look at the roughness. So let's say you're going to drive a rover there. Red is bad, blue is good. Um, this is a 15 meter resolution and uh, I'm not seeing a lot of blue here, I'm seeing a whole lot of red. This is not looking good for our little rover. But again, the resolution here is 15 meters. If you're designing a robotic rover, my guess is it's probably gonna be fairly much smaller than 15 meters. So let's chunk down the resolution to three meters. Oh, all of a sudden things are looking much better here. If you get the right resolution, we can see, okay, there are places we can drive our rover. Here we look at slope, again. So red is bad, blue is good. You can figure out ways to traverse to pretty much wherever you need to go using a tool like this. We can put together 3D terrain views. You can do flyovers, this is kind of fun. And you can even pipe the output to 3D printers. This is really fun. So you can take different types of data and you can stack them together. So here again, laser altimeter view of the volcanoes there at the Marius Hills. Now we're going to take a look at a gravity map from the Japanese Kaguya spacecraft. Same area, and red is high gravity, and Blue is low gravity. And now what we can do is we can blend those two views together. And what we see here, what we're seeing here, is down beneath that big shield volcano, this plug, now solid plug of uninterrupted lava. And it's causing that gravity anomaly right there in red. So this is kind of cool. You can take a bunch of different data from a bunch of different instruments on a bunch of different missions, blend them together, and start finding really cool things. So this is my project now. This is the, this is the project that I am leading. Um, I'm not supposed to say this, but I'll let you know. Um, we've done a similar thing with the asteroid Vesta. And at the end of next month, we're going to do a public release of our VESTA version of this. So the Dawn mission, DWN, uh, recently visited VESTA. And we've come up with a really cool tool to allow you to explore VESTA. And Dawn is now about to go into orbit around the largest object in the asteroid belt, Ceres. And we're looking forward to doing the same with that. And it'll just keep going on and on. And it even gets better, because now we've come out with Moon Tours, our mobile version of LMMP, so you can explore the moon from the comfort of wherever you happen to be. Uh, the iOS version is out, the Android version is coming shortly, I'm testing it right now. And so that's kind of what we've been doing with the moon. Um, 
It's fun stuff. It's been a heck of an adventure. Um, got some other neat adventures coming up here. We're working on sending a rover into one of those permanently shadowed areas at the pole of the moon. A lot of exciting things. Um, again, I took anything but a straight path to get here. And that probably worked out to my advantage. So in terms of advice, I guess what I would say is, you know, in the old days, people would have their jobs decided for them when they were like 12 years old. That is your path, you are going to be doing that. And even when I first went to college, there was a great deal of pressure. You're going to make a decision now. This is going to be your major. This is what you're going to do with the rest of your life. It's a lot of pressure on you. Um, you know, the one thing I learned by going down the wrong path, turning around, going back to school, going down another wrong path, turning around, going back to school. You can keep doing it. Keep learning. Learning is a lifetime adventure. And if you find yourself doing something that you suddenly realize, wow, this isn't for me, then there's something about it. Don't stick with it. Don't be miserable. You know? Go back. Go back to school and figure out what it is you want to do. Do what it is that makes you happy. Do what it is that really pushes your butt. Because man, when you find that, it's cool, it's fun, it's a blast. So with that, if I haven't rendered you all unconscious, I'll be happy to try and take any questions you may have. Yes, in the back. You spoke on one of the rockets you launched that were unmanned, as I understand, environmental controls. What kind of considerations for environmental controls for unmanned rockets do you have? So, right, so how do we, uh, why do, why do we have to do environmental controls on an unmanned rocket? Um, have you ever been to Florida in the summertime? Regrettably. Yeah, it's, 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 un, it's, it's an unpleasant place to be. You know, I'm sorry if the Florida tourist board gets mad at me. But, um, do not go to Florida in July. Do not. And especially, now imagine you have delicate scientific instruments locked up inside nice sheet metal surroundings, baking in the hot Florida sun. You need air conditioning. You do not want to fry your delicate scientific instruments, right? So, um, also, Florida is famous for its humidity. And, you know, mixing, mixing water with electronics is generally something you try to avoid. <laughs> so, again, we've got pretty good air conditioning going on inside that rocket as it sits there in the hot, sweltering, steamy environment of Florida. And yeah, yes? Yeah, so now we uh, have had additional measurements coming from LRO and from some additional probes, and we have come to realize that there are many, many millions, if not billions of tons of water ice at the poles of the moon. This is good news. Because if at some point we decide to live and work on the moon, that will come in very handy. If you're living and working on the moon, water is something you are really, really, really going to need. You need water to drink. Getting water from the surface of the earth to the surface of the moon is expensive. About $100,000 per gallon of water. If you're living and working on the moon, I guess that you're going to want a whole lot more than just a gallon of water. So that quickly mounts up. But it isn't just for the ability to drink water. You take that water, you break it apart into its component, hydrogen and oxygen. The oxygen will be useful for breathing, which again is something you really, really, really want to do if you're working on the moon. And that hydrogen comes in handy as fuel. So, 
Water is almost literally worth its weight on weight in gold on the moon. And finding that there is an incredible resource. Yes. <coughs> on the first craft, when you're um, when there was in the shadow of the moon, and you said that it excavated and it went inside, um, what do you actually use as a fuel source since there's not any sun exposure? Like, do you actually have fuel? Like, how's it being? Oh, okay. So the way the impact worked is that upper stage of the moon rocket. You know, we were we were just flying ballistically toward the moon. Now, one of the things that we did while we were on our way to the moon is we opened up the valves to the fuel tanks on that rocket, to the vacuum of space so that we sucked any remaining fuel out of that rocket. Because the last thing we wanted to do is measure the composition of our fuel. <laughs> so the idea is when that rocket hit, it was bone dry. Didn't have any fuel, it was just coming in. It didn't explode, there weren't any explosives on board. It was just a big piece of metal moving at 5,600 miles an hour. And so it blasted that hole in the ground just by kinetic energy, just by thumping it really, really hard. So no fuel at all. It excavated that hole in the ground just by hitting so hard and so fast with two tons of weight. What, what I meant was the actual robot that was that was put into the crater, or the, um, the excavation site itself. Oh. If there's no sun at that Part of the moon. Right, so what happened is that so our robotic spacecraft, so after the after the big rocket hit and blasted that plume of stuff up into the sky, then our robotic spacecraft dove down through that plume, analyzed it while we were flying through it. But we didn't fire our engines again. So four minutes after that rocket plowed into the ground, we plowed into the ground four really busy minutes. And boom, then it was all over. Yes? Um, you said that the mission, you know, first such MSC moon was only happened and then analyzed everything in the next craft. Were there other plans that could also got an analysis of whether there were ice in there? And if there were, why weren't they? Beautiful. So, yeah, so we had uh, the, we had the, uh, the, the rocket booster hit the ground, and then we came in and analyzed it with the all cross robotic spacecraft. How about any other observations? And yes, as a matter of fact, our friend LRO was in orbit around the time, so it watched the hit of the rocket booster, and then it also observed the impact of LR of L cross too. So it watched two impacts. And then we had the biggest observatories here on Earth pointing up there and measuring, too. So we had all kinds of measurements going on during that time. Now, one of the tricks is that what we were doing is we were measuring and the, the, the instruments that we have are called neutron spectrometers. And this is what first told us, hey, it looks like there's water here, but what a neutron spectrometer really does is it tells you there's hydrogen there. It's really, really good at telling you, here's hydrogen. It's really, really bad at telling you what form the hydrogen takes. Is it part of a compound? Is it just hydrogen on its own? We didn't think it was just hydrogen on its own. Couldn't figure out how that would just stay on the moon and just float away. So we figured it's part of some compound. One of the most common compounds out there with hydrogen is H2O. But our instruments weren't really telling us that. They just said, it's hydrogen. What we needed to do was something to actually get our hands wet. We needed to go excavate that crater and really sniff it out. So that's what LCROSS did. And it was able to verify, does this hydrogen really correspond to water ice? And it was, yes, it does. And so then, with the neutron spectrometer on LRO, it says, okay, now that I know what that means, I can start sniffing out all the water patches and it's finding them everywhere. So, yeah, it, it, it's kind of a multi-step process. Yes? Is the ultimate goal to eventually live on the moon? Oh, the ultimate goal is to live a whole bunch of places. Um, you know, people have their eyes on Mars. 
We have our eyes on Mars. Mars is a very cool place. It takes like three days to get to the moon. It takes six months to get to Mars. In both cases, you're living outside, you're living in what we call deep space. You're beyond the Earth's protective magnetic field in a pretty harsh environment. Now, the way I like to look at it, and this is not official NASA policy, this is, this is now you're hearing Brian Day's policy. <laughs> There's a lot of thought about this, but you know, if you're going to, let's say, let's say you, this summer you decide you're gonna go up to the Sierras. <clears throat> You're going to go camp up at 12,000 feet high up on the coast. And so you go to REI and you get your stove and your sleeping bag and your tent and you get all that neat stuff. What is the first thing you do? Do you throw it all into the back of your car and drive up to the trailhead and pull it out and start walking? I would not recommend that. <laughs> Maybe a better idea is to take it home pull it all out, set it up in your backyard, learn how to use that stove, learn how to set up the tent, get so you're feeling pretty comfortable with that, and then head to the trail. And I said the moon is two days away, two or three days away. Mars is six months away. The moon's our backyard. But yeah, the, the, the ultimate goal is Mars and even beyond. Because one of the things we're finding out is that our solar system seems to be a lot more full of habitable, potentially habitable places than we thought. You know, here on Earth, wherever we find liquid water, we find life. Even in the boiling pools of Yellowstone, even beneath the frozen ice caps of Antarctica, even in the cooling systems of nuclear reactors. Wherever we find liquid water, we find light. And so if there are other worlds where there's liquid water now, we're getting interested. Mars, we think, well, we know it used to have liquid water. We can see the shorelines of the ancient seas. We can see the riverbeds. And we see evidence that there may still be liquid water beneath the surface. But Jupiter's moon, Europa, seems to have an ocean of liquid water beneath a global ice cap. And so do, so do three of its other moons, Callisto, Gan Ganymede, and not even, not I hope. Uh, two, two of its other moons, Callisto and Ganymede, excuse me. So that's three moons on Jupiter. Now we go out to Saturn. You know, we kind of had to infer the existence of those oceans by remote sensing. But at Saturn, one of its moons, Enceladus, has cracks in its global ice cap and it's erupting geysers of water. We don't have to infer anything. It got us wet. <laughs> There's definitely water there. And uh, its moon Titan looks pretty interesting too. So there are a lot of interesting places throughout the solar system. And we look at asteroids, great for mining, great for resources, maybe places to live. We want to end up spreading out throughout the solar system. Because one thing we learned from the dinosaurs the hard way is that any single planet species is ultimately doomed to extinction. So our future's out there. Yes? Um, I think like historically space exploration has been more of a thing for like big government, um, things like that. but. Do you think there's like a future for uh, it to be more pri uh, privatized, um, such as like SpaceX has yeah. kind of been able to do? Because that's kind of like a new thing as far as taking space exploration and making it more like privatized instead of... So is there a role like for government. private industry in space exploration? Yeah. yeah, there has been for a while. You know, when you take a look at the Atlas V rocket that was built by Lockheed, you know, um, but yeah, your point is well taken. Space exploration is something that's taken on by the money of governments. It's big, it's expensive. You don't have an immediate return on the dollar, especially for basic science. But now, now that 
NASA and the other space agencies have kind of blazed that trail, and the technology is being more developed, now you're starting to see private industry want to get involved. And that's what's happened now in terms of, you know, getting people to and from the space station. NASA doesn't need to do that anymore. We've learned how to, we've spent years, we've spent years putting people in low Earth orbit. So now that's getting turned over to private industry, to SpaceX, to Boeing. And they're going to take over that kind of transportation. And now we're going to start looking further out. That's what NASA does. That's where you don't have an immediate return on investment. So again, that's the role of government. But as we keep marching further out, private industry keeps marching out too. And so you'll see, you know, there's a wonderful thing now, the Google Lunar X Prize, where you've got a bunch of private competitors, not government funded, who are working on missions to the moon. That's exciting. All right, let's give uh, Brian a round of applause.